He meditates day and night. He is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. But the wicked are not so. But they are like the chaff that the wind drives away. Therefore, the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the wicked will perish. In Psalm chapter 1, we are told to live life like the blessed man. And I begin by asking the question this morning, What does it mean in Scripture to be blessed? I mean, if there's ever a term that's thrown around in Christian culture, it's the term blessed or blessing. And I ask you the question this morning, how does the Bible define the term blessed? What does it mean? Because as we look at the way our culture uses the term blessed, It's sometimes used in very wrong ways. As we discussed in our Bible study on Wednesday night, it is not uncommon to drive down the road and and see a a car with a a message on the back or a license plate that reads, Blessed. And here this person is driving this very expensive luxury automobile or sports car, and the message being conveyed is, I have a lot of money, I have a lot of nice things, I am blessed. So to be blessed in this mindset, in this way that the term blessed is used in our culture, is to have prosperity in material things. To have, to have lots of, of money and possessions. But my question is, is that how the Bible uses the term in blessed? Not at all. It seems that the term blessed in Scripture is the exact opposite of how the term is so often used in our culture. To be blessed is not to have the riches of this world. Blessings certainly do come from God. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of lights, we read in James chapter 1. Oh, it is true that every blessing is from God, but what does it mean to be blessed? Not simply to receive a blessing, to receive some kind of of kindness or charity or mercy from God, but to actually be in a state of blessedness, to live a blessed life. In order to find the definition of this word, I really want us to hear how Jesus uses the term. If you want to define this word biblically, you can go to many places, but I think the best place to read what it means to be blessed is found in the words of Jesus in Matthew chapter 5. So I want you to hear Jesus at the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 5. If you want to go there in your Bibles, it's Matthew 5 verse 3. Uh, But we don't have it on the screens. But just listen to what Jesus says here about what it means to be blessed. Matthew chapter 5, beginning in verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst, not for riches, but those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted, For righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you 
falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. How does Jesus use the term blessed? The blessed person is the person whose reward is great in heaven. The blessed person is the one who knows that this world has nothing to offer them, but that all that they need is found in Jesus Christ. The blessed person is the one who is satisfied with what God has provided. The blessed person does not need the riches of this world. The blessed person does not desire to live an easy life. Rather, the blessed person, if I were to define it biblically, is the person who is satisfied with God and with what God has provided. The blessed person says, God is enough and He has given me all that I need and I'm going to stop complaining and I'm going to stop always wanting something more and feeling like God has shortchanged me, and I'm finally going to say, I am blessed. Because God is good. I am His child. I've been covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. And I don't need anything more. Now, if God so decides to be merciful to me and give me anything beyond salvation in Jesus Christ, then that will be icing on the cake. But God does not owe me anything and I realize that in Christ, I am rich. I may not have worldly riches, but I have heavenly riches which are far greater. The blessed man is the man or the woman who is satisfied with God and with what God has provided, namely, salvation in Jesus Christ. And so here in Psalm 1, we see that Jesus uses the word blessed the same way that the psalmist does at the beginning of the book. Psalm 1 verse 1, blessed is the man. And before he tells us who the blessed man is and what the blessed man does, he tells us who the blessed man is not and what the blessed man does not do. If you want to be blessed, if you want to live a life of being fulfilled and satisfied with God in all that He provides you, you first need to know what not to do. So the first thing is, here's what you shouldn't do. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the way of sinners, nor sits in the seat of scoffers. What does it mean to walk in the counsel of of the wicked. Simply stated, it means to live how the world tells you to live. And I have a question for you this morning. As you look back into your life when you've done foolish things, ra raise your hand this morning if you've ever done something really foolish in your life you wish you could take back. All right, good. The rest of you are liars, okay? We've all done foolish things. Don't tell me you've never been a child or a teenager or a husband. But anyways, the, the, the blessed man does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. The blessed man doesn't live the way that foolish people would tell him or her to live. The blessed man knows that this world's counsel, that this world's advice is wrong. And it is rotten to the core and it leads to destruction. And so the blessed man does not walk, does not live his life according to the counsel of the wicked. Let me just break it down to you. Don't do what your friends and your peers tell you to do. Do what God tells you to do. Live your life according to what Scripture says. Do not buy into the stupidity and the foolishness of this world. This world is wrong about so many things. And if you are taking advice, if you are taking counsel, if you are living your life according to what people in this world tell you to do, you will make huge mistakes that you will regret. 
And so the psalmist is pleading to us and crying out to us, the blessed man does not walk in the counsel of the wicked. So don't do what the world tells you to do or you will live to regret it. The second thing the blessed man does not do, he does not stand in the way of sinners. In the Bible and especially the book of Psalms, the way is the way of life. How a person lives their life, it's their character, it's, it's what the person is known for. And the blessed man does not stand in the way of sinners. So let me simplify that. The blessed man does not do the things that others do. The blessed man lives a different life. He knows that the deeds of this world are empty and vain and lead to sorrow and heartache and destruction. And so the blessed man or woman does not stand in the way of sinners. He or she does not live their life like everyone else. Listen, if you're going to follow Jesus Christ, if you're going to be a Christian, you have to be different than others around you. I, I don't know if that's news to you or not. But in our culture, it seems that we have so many people who want to call themselves Christians and yet live like the world at the same time. Let me be very plain. You can't do that. You simply can't have it both ways. You're either going to live like the world lives or you're going to live like Jesus tells you to live. And you must make a choice. Jesus says, that the, the gate is wide and the path is broad that leads to destruction. And there are many who find it, but the gate is narrow and the path is hard that leads to eternal life. And there are comparatively very few who find it. Which gate have you gone through? Which path, which way of life are you living? The broad, the easy way, or the narrow and the hard way? Are you headed toward eternal destruction or eternal life? You're on one of the two roads. You're either living your life the way that others do. You're either standing in the way of sinners, doing what the rest of the world does, or you are living a life that is markedly different, and you can't hide that. Listen, if you are going to live for Jesus, there are going to be people who make fun of you, who criticize you, who call you stupid, who even hate you for the way that you live. Remember what Jesus said, blessed are you when others persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account, for great is your reward in heaven. And so my question to you today is, do others look at you and say, you know what, his, her life is different from others. That man, that woman, that young man, that young woman is different. They're not living like everyone else in this world. And my question to you today is, would others truly say that about you? Because if they wouldn't, something's wrong. Because when you don't stand in the way of sinners, you will be different and it will be obvious to everyone around you. Lastly, the blessed man does not sit in the seat of scoffers. Scoffers are those who mock God and His Word. Scoffing is when a culture says that we don't have to do things the old-fashioned way. Marriage can be defined however we choose. It's not just between a man and a woman. It's between two consenting adults. Two men, two women, three or four people, whatever you want, it doesn't matter. We're not going to be old-fashioned here. We're not going to be constrained by puritanical culture. No, we're going to do things the enlightened way. We're, we're going to do things the way that the world tells us to do them. The culture that scoffs is a culture which says... Do these things and you will be happy. 
Work hard to, to get these earthly riches. Don't, don't, don't go to church. Don't waste your life giving to God's kingdom. Don't, don't spend your time and your hard-earned money on, on things for other people. Live for yourself. A culture which scoffs at God is a culture that tells you that everything in God's Word is wrong. As Isaiah said in Isaiah chapter 5, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who trade light for darkness and darkness for light, who change bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. And is that not what our culture does? It turns everything on its head. Things which are good, our culture calls bigoted, narrow-minded, and things that are evil, our culture calls freedom, liberty. Our culture gives a license for evil and prohibits what God's Word commands. And my question to you today is, are you going to sit in the seat of scoffers looking down upon judging God's Word and saying, I don't have to do what God tells me to do. I know better. Because that's what the rest of the world is doing. Or are you going to sit under God's Word, not looking down in judgment upon what God has so clearly spoken in the Bible, but sitting under the Word of God, surrendering your life to God's commands, submitting to the counsel of the Creator of the universe and saying, God, you tell me how to live your life. I'm going to look into your Word and find what you want me to do. The blessed man is not the man who sits in the seat of scoffers. He does not judge God's Word foolish, but he knows that God's Word is wisdom. That's why in verse 2 it says, but the blessed man, his delight is in the law of the Lord. Now when it speaks of the law of the Lord, it simply means the whole of Scripture, the Bible. And so the blessed man finds his joy, his delight in the Bible. That might sound strange to you. What makes him truly happy, what gives him real joy and satisfaction is a book? It's not necessarily the book itself that makes, you know, holding a Bible in my hands that makes me joyous and happy, but rather embracing and living my life according to what it teaches. Knowing that this book is full of precious wisdom. Knowing that this book tells me truths which I so desperately need. The Bible continually, constantly tells us that Scripture is full of great wisdom, of infinite value. I want you to hear from Proverbs chapter 8 as the, the Bible tells us to run from the wisdom of the world and run to the Word of God. The Bible says in Proverbs 8, Chapter 1, does not wisdom call? And wisdom here is the voice of Scripture. The voice of God calling out through His Word. Does not wisdom call? Does not understanding raise her voice? On the heights beside the way at the crossroads, she takes her stand beside the gates in front of the town. At the entrance of the portal, she cries aloud. So, so Scripture is calling out to you as you go through your life, as you go on your way, as you live every day. And God is calling out to you through His Word. Listen to me. To you, O oh men, I call, and my cry is to the children of man. O oh, simple ones, learn prudence. <coughs> o oh, fools, learn sense. Hear, for I will speak noble things, and from my lips come what is right. From my mouth, for my mouth will utter truth. Wickedness is an abomination to my lips. All the words of my mouth are righteous. There is nothing twisted or crooked in them. They are all straight to Him who understands and right to those who find knowledge. Now listen to this. Take my instruction instead of silver and knowledge rather than choice gold. Now let's be honest this morning. 
If I had a bar of gold and a Bible, and I said, you can have either one, just pick. Which would you choose? Now, that doesn't mean you can go home and get another Bible somewhere else. I mean, truly, the idea here is, is you can either have earthly riches or God's Word, but you can't have both. Which would you choose? Take my instruction instead of silver, my knowledge rather than choice gold, for wisdom is better than jewels. And all that you may desire cannot compare with her. Now I ask you this question. Do you really believe in your heart that that is true? Do you really believe that God's Word is more valuable than all the riches of this world? One of my favorite hymns, and I have a lot of favorite hymns, one of my favorite hymns is I'd Rather Have Jesus. And the first verse says, I'd rather have Jesus than riches or gold. I'd rather be His than have riches untold. I'd rather have Jesus than houses or land. I'd rather be held by His nail-pierced hand than to be the king of a vast domain or be held in sin's dread sway. I'd rather have Jesus than anything this world affords today. I ask you this question. I know that you know in your head that is true. But do you believe it in your heart? Because if you believe it in your heart, you will live your life according to it. Is that how you're living your life? Is the most precious thing to you the Word of God and what it teaches? Is that really what you're living your life for? Are you really living your life for Jesus Christ to serve Him, to know Him better? Do you really find delight in His Word and what His Word teaches you? Or do you find delight in what this world has to offer? Is the greatest comfort to your soul a television? Is the greatest comfort to your soul watching your favorite sports team play? Is the greatest comfort to your soul something that this world has to offer? Or is the greatest, most precious comfort to your soul the Word of God? The blessed man delights in the law of the Lord. Do you find delight in the law of the Lord? Do you love God's Word with a passion knowing that from it flows the streams of life as Jesus tells us? His delight is in the law of the Lord and on His law He meditates day and night. Verse 2. What does it mean to meditate on God's law day and night? It basically means this. To live day in and day out thinking biblically. To meditate on God's laws day and night, number one, requires that you know God's Word well enough to actually be thinking about it as you're going through your daily life. I mean, you're not supposed to walk around all day like this looking at a Bible everywhere you go. Rather, as you read it, as you study it, as you memorize portions of it, the Word of God will be in your mind and in your heart and as you go through life, you will be presented with choices and options and things to do. And you will be making choices on a, on, on a constant basis every day. And you will begin to make those choices asking yourself the question, what does God want me to do here? What does God's Word tell me to do? What does God's Word say about who I should hang out with? Who I should be friends with? How I should spend my time? What I should do? What does God's Word tell me? And if you spend time in the Word of God, it will begin to change your mind and your heart. And God works through His Word to conform you and to change you away from this world and into the image of Jesus Christ. Now, to be a Christian is not to be a person who only has their nose in the Bible and who only knows a bunch of Bible facts and doesn't live according to it. It is possible to be a biblical scholar 
and at the same time a worldly fool. That is totally possible. The Pharisees were a good example of that in Jesus' day. Many of them had entire passages of the Old Testament memorized. Some of them, the first five books of the Bible, they would have memorized. Even some of the ancient rabbis, we are told, had the entire Old Testament memorized in the Hebrew language. Now, I don't know, I wasn't there to test their knowledge, but it was, it was stated in history that, that many of the scribes and the Pharisees, the very ones that Jesus dealt with in the New Testament and asked, how do you expect to escape the fires of hell that many of these people knew the Bible better than anyone else in human history. So yes, it is possible to study God's Word and it not change your heart. But I'm also going to tell you this, it is not possible to have your heart changed and not study God's Word. Biblical knowledge is not enough. That is true. But don't let that make you think that you can live for Jesus Christ and not spend time in His Word. It is absolutely essential to your growth in the faith. If you are not spending time in God's Word, there are a million other things wrong in your life. I guarantee it. The times at which I draw closest to God, the times at which I'm walking most closely with Jesus are the times that I'm spending the most time in His Word. And you know it too. As you begin to read God's Word less and study God's Word less, you begin to live less for Jesus and more like the world. And as you begin to spend more time in God's Word, suddenly your heart begins to change, your values shift, your thinking changes, and you begin to live less like the world and more like Jesus because God works through the head to the heart to the hands. He changes your way of thinking, then He changes the things that you care about and value, and that changes the things that you do. God changes your heart and your behavior through His Word. The blessed man delights in God's Word, and he meditates on it day and night. And if that's not you, then change it this new year. Commit to study God's Word every day and think about it. Don't just read it for five minutes before you go to bed and put it away and not think or look at it again until the next night. That's not enough. It needs to get into your mind and into your heart and it needs to be your value system and, and it needs to, to direct your life and your paths and your steps every day. In verse 3 we see the, the fruit and the blessings that God gives to the blessed man, the, 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 the favor that God has upon the blessed man in his life. We read in verse 3, The blessed man, he is like a tree planted by streams of water that yields its fruit in its season, and its leaf does not wither. In all that he does, he prospers. Now look carefully at verse 3. The blessed man is like a tree planted by streams of water. What advantage would a tree planted right next to a stream of water have over other trees? Well, if the tree is planted next to a stream of water, uh, there will be moisture in that tree's soil whether it rains or not, right? That tree will get water from that flowing stream even in a time of drought. And so the picture being painted here is that the blessed man, the person who is satisfied with God and what God has provided is like a tree planted by streams of water. So even in the hardest times of life, even in a season of drought, even when the world seems to be falling down around you, you are planted by a stream of water. You are firmly rooted in the soil of God's Word and in God Himself and you have all you need even in a time of drought. You, the blessed man, can be like a stream of water and you yield your fruit in its season. You never miss a season because a child of God bears fruit for God. Jesus says you will know them by their fruit. I can't recognize the bark of an apple tree but if it's got apples on it, I know it's an apple tree. Amen? Now, if you're really smart, you might be able to tell the apple tree and all the other trees apart, you know, in the middle of the winter when there's no fruit on them. 
But man, when there, when the fruit's hanging, I can tell you what kind of tree it is, no problem. And that's the way that the blessed man is. The, the, the fruit is hanging there for everyone to see. The fruit of that man, that woman's life, yields whether it, it, in, in good times and in bad, whether there's rain or drought, he always yields his fruit in season and his leaf does not wither whether it rains or not because God supplies him. Because God is enough. And He does not need the riches of this world. He does not need the applause of men. All He needs is Jesus Christ. He knows that if Christ approves of His life, it does not matter who disapproves. Because all He needs is the praise and the approval of Jesus. The only person's opinion that the righteous man really cares about is God's opinion. What does God think of the way I'm living my life? What would Jesus say to me right now? Would He say to me, well done, good and faithful servant? And if He would, I really don't care what this world thinks about me. I care about what Jesus thinks about me. You see, that man's leaf does not wither because he is constantly being supplied by God like a stream like a tree planted by streams of water. In all that he does, he prospers. Now notice, this is a man who does not necessarily have the world's riches. Prosperity in the Bible does not mean wealth. It does not mean money. Prosperity means a life lived well. A life that is fruitful. A life that is not wasted. You see, the blessed man prospers because he is living his life for something much greater than himself. And his life is being lived well. And he takes joy and delight in serving Jesus Christ. And he knows at the end of his life it will all be worth it. In all that he does, he prospers. He looks back on his life and says it was worth it. You know, as a pastor, how many times I've spoken to a person literally on their deathbed who has confessed to me, I wish I had done things differently. I wish I had not left my wife. I wish I had not walked away from my children. I wish I'd stayed away from alcohol or drugs. I wish I hadn't done those foolish things. I wish I had spent less time working hours on end, and more time with my children. I wished I had spent more time raising my children and pouring my life into what really matters than than spending time on the lake in a fishing boat or hanging off the side of a tree hunting deer. Now hey, there's nothing wrong with doing that in moderation. But the point is, some people waste their lives doing things that we know at the end won't really matter. And we neglect the things that we know are most important. And I ask you the question, when you get to the end of your life, are you going to regret your decisions? Or are you going to say it was all worth it? I may not have had as much of worldly riches as I could have otherwise had. But oh man, what I do have, I can take with me. And so I really don't want that other stuff. Because it's not as valuable. It's not as important to me. That's not what I really want. What I really want is Jesus Christ and what He can give me. All that He does prospers. Verse 4. And here is the warning. The wicked are not so. But they are like the chaff that the wind drives away. The wicked man, the man who is not satisfied with God, but wants what the world has to offer, who is never going to be happy with Jesus, the wicked man, he is like the chaff that the wind drives away. Now, when they would harvest wheat, they would take the grain and they would throw it into the air and the wind would blow. And as the wheat would go into the air and fall to the ground, the wind would blow away the husk on the outside of the wheat and the kernels that you can actually eat would fall to the ground and the inedible husk would be blown away by the wind. And here the picture is, is that is the wicked man. 
God blows him away like the wind blows away the chaff off the wheat, which is wasteful and good for nothing, to be quite honest. But the chaff is refuse, that is to be thrown away and blown away by the wind. And that's the wicked man's life. Gone with the wind. Wasted. Worthless. Not good for anything. And the, the Bible is warning you here, if you live like the rest of the world, this will be you. Don't live your life like chaff that is to be blown away by the wind. You will regret it. Don't do the things the world tells you to do. There ought to be a giant sign over everything that this world has to offer which reads, will not satisfy. You know it's true. You know that all this world has to offer, what it tells you will make you happy if you just had this or experienced this or tried this. You know in your heart that if you ever get that thing, it doesn't satisfy you the way you hoped it would. And the truth of the matter is, is that it will not satisfy. It's going to leave you disappointed and empty on the inside. And the only one who can satisfy is Jesus Christ. And you know it's true. But are you living your life like you know it's true? It's in your head, but is it in your heart? The wicked are like chaff that the wind drives away. Verse 5, therefore, because the wind drives away the wicked, therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment. What judgment is he talking about here? The final judgment. When we all stand before Jesus Christ one day and give an account of our lives, the great white throne of judgment where Revelation 20 tells us that at the end of our lives, those who have not trusted in Jesus Christ, will be judged according to their sins, which are written down in a book, every one of them. And your sins will be read out to you one by one, and you will be found guilty and cast into the lake of fire. And the only ones who will be spared from that lake of fire on that day are those whose names are written in the book of life, who are covered by the blood of the Lamb, who have been declared righteous, because of what their Savior, Jesus Christ, has done for them. Verse 5 says, The wicked will not stand in the judgment. The wicked man will stand before Jesus Christ one day and he will eat the bitter fruit of his life. And he will not be able to escape the consequences of the way that he chose to live his life. The wicked will not Stand in the judgment. Get that through your head and through your heart. All these people in the world who seem to be getting away with so much, whose lives seem to be so grand because they have so much of what the world has to offer while they ignore Jesus Christ, they will not stand in the judgment. One day, they're going to pay for it. And you don't want to be one of them. The wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. The congregation of the righteous is picturing God's people throughout time and eternity gathered together in heaven one day when we all finally get to heaven and there we are gathered around the throne of the Lamb to worship Him forever. And you know who won't be there? The wicked. The one who wasted his life living for this world rather than for Jesus Christ. He will not stand in the congregation of the righteous for eternity with Jesus Christ. Because he has been blown away like the chaff. And his eternal home is the lake of fire. Lastly, verse 6. The certainty of how your choice will affect your eternity. There's two choices. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous. Choose to live your life righteously for Jesus Christ. And the Lord knows you. And you are His child. And He will protect you and keep you and save you and give you a heavenly home. To know here means a personal relationship with. 
How do I know that? Because the first time this word is used in the Bible is in Genesis 4.1. Adam knew his wife Eve and she conceived and bore him a son. That's a personal relationship, ladies and gentlemen. Now, here we are told that God knows the way of the righteous, meaning he has a personal relationship, an affection for, a love for his children. And he either knows you as his child or the way of the wicked will perish. He does not know you as his child because you would be counted among the wicked and you will perish. So who are you going to be today? The blessed man whose reward is great in heaven, who is satisfied with Jesus Christ and all he has to offer, who promises you everything while the world can give you nothing, who requires that you would live your life differently from everyone else, but that's okay because if you lived your life like everyone else, you'd be wasting your life anyway. And which one are you today? The blessed man who is satisfied with Jesus Christ and what He offers, or the wicked man, who will be blown away like the chaff, not stand in the judgment, and who will pay for what he or she has done. Psalm chapter 1 stands at the beginning of a Bible as a great warning. Don't waste your life. Don't live like the rest of the world, or you will regret it. This world will not satisfy. This world will disappoint you. This world will leave you empty. And I'm pleading with you from the youngest to the oldest. Hear the warning in God's Word this morning. Do not live your life like the fool, like the wicked man. Be happy with what God has provided you. Be happy with simply having Jesus Christ. Be satisfied with Him. And you will have both joy in this life and even greater joy and reward in heaven. Let's pray. Father, thank You for this warning and series of promises in Psalm chapter 1. God, I pray that we would heed what your word tells us this morning. Lord, we know it's true. But God, I pray that your spirit would get it from our head to our hearts. That we would hear this truth and live our lives according to it. God, if there's one here this morning who has not bowed the knee to Christ, I pray that they would surrender. I pray that they would just turn from their sin, realizing that their sin is empty and vain and offers nothing but sorrow and sadness and destruction. And I pray that they would surrender their life to Jesus Christ. God, if there's one here this morning who knows they need to surrender to Christ, I pray that your Spirit would call them, that they would give their life to Christ and come forward and make it known before this church today. Lord, as we sing this invitation, may your Spirit speak to our heart and lead us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand and sing this invitation. Five hundred and thirty.
amen, that's a good way to end the year, isn't it? So uh, this is our last service together We will uh, for the year. We will not have services this evening, uh, but I do uh, want to wish you a happy new year, and I hope you have a good time celebrating with your families uh, tonight and, and tomorrow for New Year. And um, we'll see you again Wednesday. Remember, we have a fellowship meal. We start serving food at 5.15, and I hope you all get to come, and we'll hear more from Dylan about the mission in Mexico and all that they are doing there. So let's close with a word of prayer as we close out this year. Darren Pache, would you pray for us?